Romans 10, 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Okay. Turn to 2 Timothy 2, 15. A lot of us should have this memorized. 2 Timothy 2, 15. But there was a time, newly saved, I didn't have things memorized. Right? It takes time. Okay? It takes time. But 2 Timothy 2.15 reads, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing workman means to labor. Okay, we're supposed to labor in the word as saved sinners. 2 Timothy 3.16 reads, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All good works. Where is the fear of God? The love, remember, the fearing God is keeping His commandments. Loving God is keeping His commandments, keeping His Word. And here it is. We're to study God's Word. What's someone's attitude towards this book when it comes to rightly dividing? You know, one of the biggest teachings after God truly saved me, led me to the Bible version issue, led me to the true plan of salvation, says, okay, now you have my perfect written word in your hands. You need to study it. You need to read it. And where it applies to you, you need to apply it to your life. What does that mean? I learned dispensational teaching. And it opened the Bible to understand the Bible from cover to cover. I was able to open the Bible and different dispensations understand that I can learn instruction righteousness throughout the whole Bible, but doctrine that's for me today is primarily in the Pauline epistles. It can be re-mentioned in the Gospels, because we've read verses in the Gospel. Uh, there's some doctrines that carry over from one dispensation to the next. Okay. Um, like I said, in every dispensation, the opportunity to repent. Repentance is there in every dispensation. And this dispensation, which is called the church age by Jesus Christ, okay, uh, in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ says that this time period that's coming up, which will be this dispensation, is going to be the time of the Gentiles. Okay. There's different dispensations. Repentance is all of them, but then when we get to our time period, the time of the Gentiles, they'll try to say there is no repentance required. It's always required. It's always there. Why are they trying to do away with it? Because they don't fear God. They don't love God and they don't fear God. They love themselves. They love their sin. They love their wickedness. Psalms 119.11. That's right now. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? It comes in and guides us into all truth. That's what the Holy Spirit, we're going to get to that verse. But the Holy Spirit gives us the Scripture. God gave us the Scriptures, and it takes the Holy Spirit to open it up to us. We're to study by the Holy Spirit. We're to study to show ourselves approved in God. Then the Bible says this is what you're supposed to look for in the Scriptures. You're supposed to look for doctrine, for how we reprove people, and how people got reproved in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation. How people get corrected, how we're supposed to correct people today, how we're supposed to prove people today. The way people were reproved in the Old Testament is that the same way we reprove people today. Reproof is there still, like it was, and correction's still there, but that's what we look to the Bible for, and instruction in righteousness. Why? Because the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We want to live for God, we want to do right in His eyes, and we don't want to do wrong. We don't, when, we, when you're lost, you come to that fear of you don't want God's wrath on you. When you get saved, you don't want God's chastening on you. You want to please God. And when you realize that something doesn't please God through study, through His scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, when you find out what, that you're doing something that doesn't please God, you're going to get it out of your life because you, you, you have a love of God and a fear of God. Psalms 119.11 reads, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, somewhere else in the Psalms it says, Wherewithal shall a young man... I think it's Psalms... I forgot this. It's, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. When you fear God and you love God, you, go, you get to a point where okay, God promised to preserve his word. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Three times in the four gospel, I worship a God that's perfect, therefore his word is perfect, whether it's the spoken word or the spoken word that gets written down. Today we have the written word. Let's say Declan's scratching it right now. Today we, my dog, sorry. Uh, today we have the written word. This is what we go off of. This is the final authority, not this. But there was people in times past who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and they were, it was the spoken word, and then it got written down. Okay? This was once the spoken word, and it's gotten written down. Okay? What is someone's attitude towards God's perfect written word? And if they say there is no perfect written word, you know what they're saying? God's not the final authority. They are the final authority. And my question comes back to where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? God just said, study to show thyself approved. If we don't have a perfect written word of God today, how can you study? All scripture is given by inspiration. How can we have all those things that God said we can get out of the scriptures if there's no perfect written word of God today? We just talked about, and I might break this into two parts, if we do a two, second part, first part, we talked about loving God and fearing God. Loving God is keeping His Word. Fearing God is keeping His commandments. If we don't have a perfect written Word of God, whether it's the spoken Word or the written Word, and like I said, today it's in the written Word, the King James Bible. If we don't have a perfect written Word of God, how can you prove that you love Him? And that's what they love. They don't want anybody to be able to prove anything, because you can't prove someone who's false. If you can't prove someone's true, guess what? You can't prove someone's false, right? They don't want people being proved to be false. How can you prove that you love God without God's perfect written word? How can you prove that you fear God without God's perfect written word? Now don't get me wrong, the laws of God are written on every man's heart. People have, an, I, have the knowledge in their heart about what's right and what's wrong, and they've got that conviction that what they're doing is wrong versus what, what God says is right. But they can gag and bound their conscience to the point where it becomes such a whisper they don't even hear their conscience anymore. They're just getting into doing things their way. But what is their attitude towards the perfect written word of God? That's, that's one of the big tests I have for people that profess to be saved today. Have you? Some of them might be ignorant. I was ignorant. I, I got a testimony from a brother in Christ that he, he got... The, he got preached the gospel out of the King James Bible and was told to get a King James Bible, but he didn't know why he had to do a King, why, why King James Bible. Why not other Bibles? And he did the Bible version study, and he's like, this is absolute truth, this is the Word of God, and I'm going to stick to it. You had brethren like me that was the other way around. I already had Bibles galore. I've been to Bible college. I was in the Babel buildings doing all kinds of stuff in the Babel buildings. Worship team, Sunday school teacher. Um... But what really saved me is, is God brought me to the Bible version issue. He waited till I was broken. He waited till I was ready and said, here's the Bible version issue. You need to study this. And I started studying the Bible version issue. And that's when I got a King James Bible and I started believing that it was God's word. And then I was preached the gospel out of the King James Bible and realized I was a false convert my whole life. I need to really get saved. And when God saved me, he opened the scriptures to me. It's like clockwork. These guys, I get, I don't want to distract from the teaching, brothers of Christ, but I get uh, spam calls at, at the same time, and I forgot to unplug, so forgive me, brothers. Right? But the Word of God, okay? I came to the Word of God, uh, to the Bible version issue first, and then God saved me. Some people get preached the gospel, the true plan of salvation out of the King James Bible, and God brings them to the Bible version issue later and says, here's my perfect written word so they can live a life of Christ. Now, brother, have gotten on to me because I've seen some people that say, well, I was saved when I was seven years old. When did God bring the Bible, the true plan, the true Bible to you, to your knowledge, like the Bible version issue? Oh, I just learned the Bible version issue last month, and I just got a King James Bible, and, and, and now I believe it's God's word. Uh, I don't believe you were saved when you were 12, 7 years old. God does not leave you ignorant for 30, 20, 10, 20, 30 years. 
Every testimony I've had of somebody who's truly saved and born again, at some point soon, God brought them to the Bible version issue and got them in the King James Bible. And it always goes back to the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord. You have a love of the Lord. Lord, show me the truth. I have a love of the truth. I have a love of your word, your commands. Lord, show me where I can find them. And God will show you the truth. The King James Bible. As he did me. Whether it's Christ. A true test. Prove your own selves. Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. How do we check whether we're in the faith? And how do we prove ourselves? Through the perfect written word of God. Not through feelings and opinions, not through church fathers, not through traditions of men, not through culture, not through the flesh, not through worldliness, not through Satan's way, through God's perfect written word. John chapter 16 verse 7. John chapter 16 verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter which the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Who is the Comforter? The Holy Spirit. Evidence of salvation is that you have the Holy Spirit in you. And evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in you is that he opens this book to you. And the evidence, I can keep going, the evidence that he's opening this book to you is that you're living it. It's not knowing the truth, it's living the truth. We're not supposed to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That's the ultimate, when you get to the end, the ultimate uh, proof that someone has the Holy Spirit in them and they're living the word of God, is they're living the word of God. They're taking what God commands and they're applying it to their life. And like I said, I always get kicked, kicked, kicked because of the hair thing. I use the most simplest things. I can go into more deeper things about the Godhead, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away of the body of Christ. You have people who flat out reject that. Part of me wonders and questions whether they have the Holy Spirit. You can have someone who was in a standing position who, who believed the Word of God. I know a brother in Christ who believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Looking, he believed in looking, present tense for that blessed hope. Living every day as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. He never promised to come back in a few days. He never did. But what he has commanded us to do is that we're supposed to live as if he could come back tomorrow. If Jesus came back tomorrow, are you ready? I had a brother in Christ who stood vehemently for the word of God. That's absolute truth. And now he's turned his back on it. He's part of the falling away. Oh, there is no imminent return of Jesus Christ. We don't have to be looking for Jesus Christ. Instead, we need to be hunkering down and enduring to the end to be caught up. I've had brothers and sisters in Christ hit him up and say, Hey, um, you sound post and mid-trip. Have you changed your, your stance on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ? Oh, no, 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 I have. In words, he hasn't. But in deeds, he has. Because someone who truly believes in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ, they're going to be living it. They're going to be looking for it every day. Because that's what the Bible commands us. But the comfort is the Holy Spirit. There's evidence that the Holy Spirit has come in. You know what the, Holy, the evidence is? Yeah. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And we're going to hit those things real quick because they're very important. But the Holy Spirit comes in and guides you into all truth. The Holy Spirit does, the comforter. So when you have somebody who's preaching something that doesn't line up with Scripture, is that of the Holy Spirit or is that of the flesh? Is it of the Holy Spirit, or is it of the world? Is it of the Holy Spirit, or is that a servant of Satan? A minister of Satan? This is our final authority, brothers and Christ. The Bible says, through good words and fair speech is deceiving the hearts of the simple. And what keeps you, and I keep warning the brethren, what keeps you from being simple is knowing the Word of God, studying this book, brothers and Christ, reading it, studying it, living it. So when someone comes along and tries to feed you a bunch of horse manure, you can see him for what he is. A donkey. I'm not going to say the other word, but a donkey. 
Okay. But if you're ignorant, ignorant of the scriptures, anybody can come along and say something that sounds good and can deceive anybody. The majority of these Babel building people that go to these Babel buildings, and I'm not calling them saved and I'm not calling them lost, but these people that go to the Babel buildings are so ignorant of scripture. I'm having to deal with them out there trying to preach the gospel to them because they believe they're saved. They're so ignorant of scripture. A, they don't have God's perfect written word. Most of them are using Bible perversions. But they're so ignorant of their own book. Because if they knew their own book and all the errors and calling Jesus a liar, the attacks of Jesus Christ, that they're Catholic Bibles, they come from the Vatican, they don't know this. I talked to some of them, they're ignorant. Oh, I didn't know that. Some of them just deny it. They deny truth. No, these aren't Catholic Bibles. The NIV is not a Catholic Bible. Yes, it is. The NASV is not a Catholic Bible. Yes, it is. It was put out by the Vatican. It's a Catholic Bible. The only Bible that the Vatican condemns is the King James Bible. Why? Because it's the only Bible that wasn't put out by them. And people can get into that argument all they want. Brothers and sisters in Christ, right? the Holy Spirit comes in and guides you into all truth. You need to know your Bible. You need to read it. You need to study it. There's nothing wrong with following great men of God that are preaching the Word of God. I point over here because I, I talked about in, in part one that I put a lot of Bible studies from other brethren on this hard drive. Okay? And I sit and I watch Bible studies sometimes. I spend more time putting together Bible studies. I don't have as much time to watch them as I used to. But I collect them. And I've watched him multiple times. You can follow someone that preaches the Word of God and is preaching truth, but you've got to be very careful not to turn that man into God. To turn that man into a replacement for God, to turn that man into a replacement for the Holy Spirit, to turn that man into a replacement for the Word of God. I don't need God. I don't need the Holy Spirit. I don't need the Word of God. I've got that man. He's doing all the work for me. When you become a respecter of persons, if that man's a wolf in sheep's clothing, look at all these people in these Babel buildings. They're being deceived like that. Well, how is those of us who are truly saved and born again, we study the Word of God, we love the truth, we're like, how can they be so easily deceived? Because they don't have a final authority. God's not, they don't fear God, they don't love God, and God's not, Word is not their final authority. They don't have a final authority. That man behind the pulpit's their final authority. And a lot of brothers out there in ministry that came out of these battle buildings had testimonies on this. That they started worshiping the man of God. Don't you dare question the man of God. Well, what if he's wrong? I don't care how wrong he is. You don't question the man of God. Do you know there's some brethren that I used to support here on YouTube that... They used to be. They used to get onto those Babel building people that would act like that. You don't dare question that. And now they've become just like those Babel building preachers. You don't dare question them. You don't dare question the man of God. What if he's wrong? I don't care how wrong he is. You don't question the man of God. I was watching a clip. It was it was a southern clip, so they had that accent. So I'm not trying to mock anybody. They had that accent. You don't question the man of God. Yes, if he's wrong and he doesn't line up with this book, the Bible says for reproof, for correction. That's why we have this Bible, so we can reprove people that are not lining up with this book, and we can correct people that aren't lining up with this book. We can hold people that are behind the camera on YouTube or behind the pulpits, accountable to this book. And when they're wrong, they're wrong. Period. All right. Now the Holy Spirit, we just talked about this. The beginning, God has made unto us wisdom. It started out with, we had fear of God. God gave us His commands. We have a love of His commands. But today, the Holy Spirit comes in when you get saved, and He starts opening the Scriptures to let us know what those commands are. We have a love for them, but the Holy Spirit comes in to convict us when we're not following it, and when we are, and confirm when we are following it. Okay? But what's the whole point of the Holy Spirit going out to the world? This is very important. Okay? Number one, to reprove the world of sin. The laws of God are written on every man's heart. And like I said, we've taught, it happened at the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God's laws were written on their heart from that day forward. 
They know between good and evil because God has set it out for them. The laws that are written in their heart. And from that point on, that every generation after that has had God's laws written in their heart. And at the beginning in Genesis, it talks about the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. It's all, it's all over the world. Reproving the world of sin from the very beginning. But Jesus said, I have to go away because you have God manifest in the flesh, sitting there, reproving the world, and they rejected him. He's saying, i got to go up so the Holy Spirit can come down. In the Old Testament, only certain people had the Holy Spirit, and you could lose the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the time of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, once you get saved, you are sealed into the day of redemption. Anybody can get the Holy Spirit if you come to God on His terms and get saved. And once God has given you His Holy Spirit, He's not going to take it away. So, right here He talks about the Holy Spirit going out into the world to reprove the world of sin. Why? So they fear God. Where is the fear of God? Someone who truly saved, the Holy Spirit was able to reach us and say, Hey, you need to fear God because you're a sinner on your way to hell and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. God's reached me through His Holy Spirit convicting the world. So the first thing it talks about is reproving the world of sin because they believe not on me. Psalms 37, 31. Psalms 37, 31. Psalms 37, 31. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. You know, the laws of God are written on every man's heart. But mankind, and we see it every day, they can ignore the Holy Spirit. They can quench those laws down. And instead of obeying the laws of God that are written on every man's heart, they start following the laws of the flesh, the laws of the wicked world, the laws of false gods. You can always tell who someone truly serves by how they live their life. Whose words are they obeying? Are they obeying God's words? Or are they obeying their flesh? Are they obeying God's word? Or are they obeying the world? Or are they obeying God's word, God's law? Or are they obeying or they're part of false religions, worship of false gods. In Psalms 48, it says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, the law is within my heart. And Romans 2.15 it says, Which show you the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Let that one seek in. Accusing or excusing one another. When man's the authority, we're the ones saying, well, I don't like that, but I'm okay with that. Well, well I, I don't really like that over there, but you know, this over here is okay. They don't have a final authority. The laws are written on our heart to say a conscience is bearing witness. Um, written in, our, in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. It goes on and talks about how there's that part that I just showed about how with man's the final authority, they can quench those laws. There's also the, the, the fact that the laws of God are written on every man's heart, that you can go out into a third world country where there's tribal people, and you can sit there and ask them, do you believe murder is wrong? Yes. Do you believe stealing's wrong? Yes. Do you believe sodomy's wrong? A man can be a woman, a woman can be a man. No, they can't. That's wrong. How do they know that? Because they got the Holy Spirit, the laws of God on their heart, and their conscience is bearing witness with the laws of God that are written on their heart. See, it works both ways. You can ignore that and be your own, own authority, or you still have that law of God. Because some people ask, how can some people be good people and not know God, like God's laws and everything. How can people be abiding by God's laws and not know God's laws? They do know God's laws. They're written on every man's heart. They're without excuse. 
The Holy Spirit goes out to bear witness with your conscience to say, Hey, you're a sinner. Here's God's laws. Yeah, I've tried to follow them, but have you followed every single one of them? Without fail. No, I failed them here, and I failed them there. You're a sinner. You've sinned against God. Here's the consequences of said sin. You're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity. Go to hell and then get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. That's what the Holy Spirit's for, to reprove the world of sin. That fear needs to come in. Repentance needs to come in. Then the belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. How many people you come across somebody that just feels like they skip the first step? They don't fear God. They didn't follow repentance. They just skipped everything straight to the belief. And that belief oftentimes just makes you feel like they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, but they don't believe in how he died for our sins. Sins doesn't even seem to play a part in it anymore. It did when they claimed to get saved, but now with the life they're living, sin doesn't seem to be a big deal. It still needs to be a big deal. Romans 3.10, we have it, we, we learn, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. That's what the Holy Spirit's for out there in the world, convicting the world of sin. There's no one that doeth good. You might be able to follow the laws of God over here, but you're going to be failing them over here. And if you're following them over here, you're going to be failing them over here. You still failed. You still failed. You need a Savior. You can't get to heaven your own way. You cannot get to the heaven going through the laws of sin and death, the, Levit the Levitical laws, the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. You can't make it to heaven that way. No matter how good you try to be, and you can come across some people that seem like they're really good people, but the Bible says, no, you're not. If there was a billboard that showed their life and what the thoughts that they've had and the things they did behind closed doors where nobody was watching, those good people wouldn't look so good, would they? No. But the Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So what's the Holy Spirit do? It goes out in the world and convicts the world of sin to get the fear of God in them. God says it's made unto us wisdom. What sets us apart from the lost world? We fear God. And we can prove it because we do our best to keep God's commandments. We love God. And we prove it. Why? Because we do our best to keep His Word. The lost world, there's no fear of God before their eyes. There's none. But this is Christ. When I read about Revelation, how God's pouring out His wrath and His judgment on this world, for a, it's a seven-year time period called the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's for the Jewish people, where God goes back to dealing with the Jews. And he's pouring out his wrath on this world. And people are cussing at him and cursing him and everything and getting mad at him. Why? I was asked, why? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you fall on your knees and say, Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us. Like jo uh, Jonah, when he's preaching at Nineveh. Wicked Gentiles. And yet they fell on their knees, Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us. And he did. Why aren't these people in Revelation doing that? Having, saying, Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us. No, they're cursing God. There's no fear of God before their eyes. They don't fear God. They don't love God. They don't know God. They don't. Romans 10, 16, we read, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? The Holy Spirit's out there to convict the world of sin so then God can bring someone along to preach the gospel to them. But today, they're watering down the gospel and they're trying to win souls at any cost. And now you're getting all these false converts, these fakes and these frauds that aren't truly saved because it's been watered down. Well, repentance isn't popular, so we'll take it out. 
uh, now, now, in these last days, prayer's not popular. Talking to God's not popular, so we're going to take it out. And it's just head belief. The changed life is definitely, that was the first thing that wasn't popular. The changed life wasn't popular, so after preaching that there's a changed life after salvation, true conversion, we got to take that out. Then we got to change the definition of repentance. Then we got to do away with repentance altogether. Now we got to do away with prayer. Now it's just head belief. Continue living however you want, do whatever you want, and just say you're saved. Just believe in your head you're saved, say you're saved, have a profession of faith, but no walk. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for I say, Lord, who hath believed our report. The number one reason why people today, like I was a false convert and I got converted to true salvation. I truly gave my life to Jesus Christ, found His perfect, God showed me His perfect written word, brought it to my attention. True plan of salvation, how to live my life now that I'm truly saved. And dealing with professing Christians is the toughest people to deal with when it comes to the gospel. Why? Because they've been taught not to fear God, what true fear is. Oh, fear God is just to know God. I testify that. I had a t-shirt. No, N-O, God, K-N-O, God. That's all a fear God means. No fear. If you know God, you don't have to fear God. Because you know God. Uh, no. You're supposed to fear God. All these people, they don't have fear. They've had the fear of God take, uh, either, t they pr they've been, the Holy Spirit comes in to convict them and get them fearful of God, and they had a false witness a false person come by and teach him a false gospel that takes the fear away. And now you got all these people that don't fear God. And when we try to preach the true plan of salvation to them, it's harder to reach them because you can't reach somebody that doesn't fear God. You can't reach them. God's got to break them. God's got to bring them to their knees and instill that fear back in them before you can reach them, like he did me. Like he did some of the brethren out there with their te with your testimonies. How God, you were a false convert and God brought you to your knees and instilled fear in you. When I realized that I was lied to, the gospel I was taught was false, I had Bible perversions, I was lied to about a lot of the doctrines, the fear of God started coming in. Just like a huge wave, like I'm drowning in the fear of God. Which is a good thing. I don't want to go to hell. I'm on my way to hell. I was lied to. I was deceived. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8 In flaming fire, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hell. What's the consequences for sinning against God? Hell. And then the lake of fire. Anybody, I repeat, anybody that doesn't preach on hell when they are preaching the gospel, they're servants of Satan. Every last one of them. When you go to lead someone to Christ, what is God saving us from? He's saving us from ourselves. He's saving us from the consequences of sin, which is, means he's saving us from hell, an eternity in hell, an eternity in the lake of fire. The Bible says death and hell was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoso was not written in the name of the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And it's eternal. You're, there is no annihilation. There is no burning up. You're going to suffer and pay for your sins for as long as God exists. And since God is eternal, your suffering is going to be eternal. But this doesn't get preached. Oh no, I, I was told by family members that I have that have a profession of faith that it's wrong to preach on hell when you're trying to lead people to Christ. Yeah, you mentioned that Jesus died for our sins, but you really shouldn't really be hitting sin hardcore. You should be more focused on the love that God has. Not God's wrath that's upon you. Someone who's lost. Don't worry about God's wrath. Just, just preach God's love. You need to have the fear. Where's the fear of God? Today, they're pushing false gospels and all these Babel buildings that are all about coping and sharing and caring. 
and holding hands and singing kumbaya. They're not about the fear of the Lord. They've take, they're, they're trying to prevent people from fearing God. The Holy Spirit goes out to the world to reprove the world of sin. Fear. Put, basically to instill the fear of God in them. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? The fear. What's the number one command God gives today? Obey the gospel. But you have to come to God fearful first, broken second. And repentance. I always apply them both to repentance. Repentance is having the fear of God instilled in you and come to Him broken and having sorrow in your heart for sinning against Him. The fear because you know that you are a sinner, that you're on your way to hell and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against Him. And then that sorrow comes in about your state of what you've done to your Creator. Sin against Him. You've wronged God through sinning against Him. You didn't keep His commands. You've angered your Creator. God's wrath and God's judgment is upon you. It's fearful and you're to have sorrow for it. But that's not popular to preach today. And when you've got someone who professes to be saved and that fear of God is not there, I know why now. For the longest time I would ask Brother Sir, why is it? Why don't they fear? Why don't, they're making these mistakes. They're making that. They're preaching a false gospel. They're preaching false doctrine. They have, they have a huge tolerance of sin. Sin is okay and everything. And it's like, where's the fear? Where's the fear? That's what happened. They got taught a false gospel that was a fearless gospel. You don't have to fear God. There's no fear. 2 Thessalonians 2.12 we read that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. That brought up the second thing. Why is it so popular? Why is this false gospel so popular? Easy believism so popular? Why is it I can, I can look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, just indulge in things that God clearly says is sin, and call myself a Christian. Why is that so popular? They believe not the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. The Bible talks about false converts when it says that they're lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's what we're seeing today, brothers and Christ. Now you have someone who's a, who's a false convert, and I just mentioned that, but you can have brethren that are saved to have a love of God, they were in a standing point, God changed, they, were, they got saved like this, and God did this to them. That's what he's going to do, guaranteed, to anyone who ever gets truly saved and born again. You come to him like this, and he's going to lift you up and put you on a standing point and say, okay, now you're mine, here's the do's, here's the don'ts. There's going to be a changed life, and you're going to start living for the Lord. Some people start, like, think of it like a horse race. They start out the gate super fast getting rid of things, living for the Lord. But some of them burn out real quick. And they go back to their wicked ways. Ah, I want my sin. And they have a love of God, but they are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Like I said, you have to use spiritual discernment to determine whether someone's in a fallen state or if they're truly lost. And the best, what I mean by spiritual discernment is where, when did they ever in their life be, were they in a standing position? Where they were standing for this book and what it entails. If that was never there, you're dealing with a false convert. Period. But even when someone's in a, a fallen state, you sometimes have to go back to the gospel and you got to instill fear in them. I know, brethren, that I tried to instill fear in them. God, what about the chastisement of the Lord? How you're treating the brethren, what you're standing for, the sin that you're promoting, the idolatry that you're promoting, the pride, the ego. Where's the fear of God? He can chastise you. He can take things away. He can punish you. He can heap a whole load of trouble on you. Where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? It always starts with the fear of God. 
The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where it starts and it continues for the, all eternity. We as His creation are supposed to fear God. That's where it starts. And I've talked about true love for God is keeping His commandments because they go hand in hand. If you love God, then you're going to fear God. And the evidence is going to be you're keeping God's words. You're keeping God's commandments. It starts with the fear of God to keep His ultimate commandment to obey the gospel. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to get tossed in the lake of fire. That fear needs to be there. Not that desire that you don't want the punishment, but the fear that I don't want to spend eternity there. I'd, want to, I'd rather spend eternity with my Lord and Savior. I'd rather spend eternity with God, serving Him and doing what's right. Lord, I'm so sorry for the man that I am. Talk about salvation. For the man I am. A wicked, dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner. And I deserve to go to hell, Lord. I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I can do? And God points you to the cross. God, the Father, points you to His Son, Jesus Christ. This is not happening today, brothers and sisters in Christ. They're skipping that part. They're skipping that part, and they're trying to go straight to the cross. Oh yeah, like, like it's a uh, tourist attraction. Oh yeah, I'm going to the cross like a tourist attraction. Hey, I'm eating popcorn. Here's the, here's, here's the cross where Jesus died. You know, Jesus is dying and everything. You're eating popcorn like it's a movie or something. And they do. They have movies now where people are just eating popcorn at the theaters, watching them crucify a Catholic Jesus Christ, not the real Jesus Christ. But it's just, that's how people treat it. They, they just skip the first part and come, go straight to the cross. And it's like, you can't do that. And truly get saved and born again. There was people on their knees crying about what was happening to Jesus at the cross. There was people looking away. It was so bad. And these, these easy believers got so heated when I pointed out to them that their whole false gospel has no fear of God, no love of God, and they treat sin like it's okay. Just whip them again. Just whip them again. It's okay. You can whip them. That's the easy believers and false gospel that's out there. And they all, oh, that's not true, that's not It is an absolute truth. I was one of them. I was so wicked as a false convert in, under this easy believism. And since God saved me, truly saved me through repentance, fearing God and coming to Him broken, and then going to the cross, God has cleaned up my life. I'm not even close to the wicked man that I once was. I still fail the Lord. I still sin. But I'm not even close to the man I was. And brethren, be careful when people misuse that verse that Paul talks about being the chiefest of sinners. He's talking about at salvation. He's talking about salvation in that chapter. He's like, at salvation, I was the chiefest of sinners. And if God can save me being the chiefest of sinners, then God can save anybody that will come to Him broken on His terms. And that's why I say Paul's not the chiefest of sinners. I was. And if God can save me and give me a new life and put me on the right path, He can do it for anybody that will come to Him, fearing Him and broken, and go into the cross and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessing both in prayer and asking God to save them. God can save anybody. That's what Paul was saying. Some people grab that and act like present tense, Paul. He's been saved now for 13 years. There's one thing, he was there preaching for three years here. And then he was here for like 10 or 12 years. He's been saved for 20 years. And they act like you can be saved for 20 or 30 years and still be the chiefest of sinners. That's part of that easy believism garbage. There doesn't have to be a changed life. You can be carnally minded and walking after the flesh and still be saved. Yet Romans chapter 8 says, no, you can't be saved. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Sodomy is getting out of control today. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. 
When you read those things that I just said, brother, sister Christ, have you noticed that even among the body of Christ, brethren that I believe are saved, they're doing these things. Truce breakers, false accusers, despisers of those that are good, unthankful. Four, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. There's where we get that verse. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. There's justification to break fellowship with brethren. There's justification for saying, hey, I don't believe you're truly saved. You're lost. You're a false convert. I cannot have fellowship with you. All I can do is preach the gospel to you. And if you reject the true plan of salvation, you reject, you reject God's perfect written word, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I want nothing else to do with you. The Holy Spirit goes in the world, number two, to prove the world of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Titus chapter 2. Read Titus chapter 2. The whole chapter. But Titus chapter 2, 1 through 5. But speak in now the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperance, sound in the faith, and charity and patience. Notice how it's so different. When he reproves the world of, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. The Holy Spirit's out there to reprove the world of their wickedness and their sin. The Holy Spirit's here to reprove us, to get us to live a life of Christ, to be a light to this dark world, that the aged men be sober, grave. Let's go back to verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in the faith, and charity, self-sacrifice, and patience. The aged women likewise, they, have, they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. What does it mean by the word of God be not blasphemed? Because the way a woman is supposed to treat her husband is the way the body of Christ is supposed to treat Jesus Christ. The bride and the bridegroom. He commands. He's the authority. He's the head covering of the church as a whole. He says how things are going. He says yes. He says no. We say yes, sir. Yes, my Lord. That's Abraham calling, that's Sarah calling Abraham my Lord. Yes. And when you have women, this feminism, this, which is witchcraft today, that women are not under the authority of their husbands. They're not under the authority of their fathers. They're not under the authority of any man. What do they do? They cause the word of God to be blasphemed because then they teach the church of the whole that you don't have to be under the authority of Jesus Christ, who is our bride. Uh, we're the bride, he's the husbandman. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, and all things show in thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine shown uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. You're not supposed to use sarcasm. You're not supposed to be mocking, name-calling. Okay. Sound speech. You're supposed to be sincere. You're supposed to preach the word of God in sincerity and in truth. That he that is of the contrary part might be ashamed. All this, we're, it's this certain thing that we're supposed to be different than the world now. The Holy Spirit's now in the world in us to reprove us, to get us to be living right in God's eyes. So we can be a light to this dark world. How do we know? Let's keep reading. Having no evil thing to say of you, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing them all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things, to be a light for Jesus Christ to your loss, to people you work for. Verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, 
To was the Holy Spirit going out into the world to do for us who are saved? To reprove us? Reprove the world of righteousness? Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us, but we still need to live right now. We belong to God. We have to set the example. An ungodly of this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Brothers, this is Christ. He goes out to the world to what? To reprove the world of righteousness. God's righteousness is impugned to us. We belong to God. Paul said, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid how we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Ephesians 4. Turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4.19 through 32 Who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. There's supposed to be a difference between us and the lost world. And so be that ye have heard him and that have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye may put on the new man, which is of God, is, which after God is created in righteousness. After God is created in righteousness, which we're going to get into more in part two of this series. Righteousness and true holiness, when we get into the righteousness part of prove your own selves. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man's truth with his neighbor, for we are the members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which are good, that he may have to give to them him that needeth. change life. The Holy Spirit's here to reprove us and let us know that we are now made righteousness by Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, and we need to live for him now. We belong to him and we need to live for him. There's supposed to be a difference. When we read part one, when the Holy Spirit goes out and reproves the world, we just read all the things about traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than the love of God, fierce, despisers, unthankful, just as being parent. And then we read how someone who's saved, who now has the righteousness of God in them, we read how they are supposed to live. There's supposed to be a difference. You can't just say, I'm a Christian, and do all those things in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It doesn't work that way. Where's the fear of God? There was never no fear of God. You were talked out of fearing God and given a false gospel. Let no corrupt communication proceedeth out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Some people say, oh, you can still grieve the Holy Spirit with sin. That's not what grieving the Holy Spirit is. It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, and here it tells you how you grieve it, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. True grieving the Holy Spirit is letting someone come along and talk you out of that out of your salvation. Getting you to believe that you have to earn salvation. Getting you to believe that you can lose your salvation. Because you have to earn it, therefore you can lose it. The Holy Spirit can come by sometimes and get you to doubt your salvation because you're not living a life of Christ. That's a good thing. That's okay. The, okay. But what happens is the devil comes along and tries to talk you into believing you can lose your salvation. That's where the grieving of the Holy Spirit comes in. When you start falling into the trap of believing that you can lose your salvation. That you don't know, I don't, you stop believing that you're sealed into the day of redemption. That's what true grieving the Holy Spirit is. Right? 
Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. To reprove the world of righteousness. To make sure that, hey, you stay in that standing position. And any time you fall, the Holy Spirit's there. The reason God gave us His Holy Spirit is to get us back up. To get us up to the standing position to begin with when we first get saved. And then any time we fall, it's to get us back up. We're not supposed to be like the world. We're not supposed to be like the world at all. The third thing it says, uh, the Holy Spirit, okay, to judge, of judgment. Because the prince of this world is judged. I can't wait for that. I, I have to wait to that day, but I long for that day where the, the prince of this world is judged. Who's the lowercase g God of this pardon me? Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. Acts 17:31. Acts 17:31. Acts 17:31. Acts 17:31. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, Jesus Christ. Notice it says he will judge the world in righteousness. No, no, it's just the lost people. He will judge the world in righteousness by that man who he hath ordained, or if he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Everyone's going to be judged someday, brother, says Christ. Everyone, saved and lost. The difference is, I have Jesus Christ as my advocate. He's standing between me and God the Father. Someone who's lost and rejects Jesus Christ, they have nobody stand between him and, and, and hell. Nobody. John 8, 44, we read, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan. Satan is going to go to the lake of fire someday. And all those who reject Jesus Christ, there's only two sides. Jesus Christ or Satan. Jesus Christ or Satan. And today they've deceived the world into believing that there's Jesus Christ and there's 50 other ways. All of those are still Satan. And if you choose Satan, you're going to end up where Satan's going. For he is the liar and the father of it. 2 Corinthians 11.13 we read. 2 Corinthians 11.13 for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I will, my salvation, my eternity, is not going to be based off my works. My rewards will be at the judgment seat of Christ. My, uh, the inheritance will be. If you suffer for Jesus Christ, you shall also reign with Jesus Christ. You can get saved and chicken out, and you never suffer for Jesus Christ, and you can miss out on that inheritance. Okay? We can lose things, but the one thing that is, is our eternity is not judged by our works. But if you're lost and you reject Jesus Christ, your eternity is is judged on by your works. You're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne, and your works will be judged. And if you broke the law of sin and death, which is the Levitical laws, the laws of God that are written on every man's heart, you broken so much as one of them, you're going to get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. And that's where Satan's going. And when you look at it, brother, says Christ, anybody who rejects Jesus Christ is going to end up going where Satan's going. Why would anybody want to do that? There's no fear of God. There's no fear of God. Revelation 19.20. Revelation 19.20. This is where we really get into it, what happens to him. What happens to Satan. 
Revelation 19:20. Now remember, the devil was I mean the hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for us. If you wind up there, you wind up in the same place that Satan goes. And the average, I know you got those crazies out there, but the average person out there says, I'm not for Satan. Then why do you reject Jesus Christ and then you're going to wind up where Satan's going to wind up? That needs to be preached to them. They're on their way to hell and the lake of fire and that's where Satan's going. Once again, people who don't preach, you have preachers that don't preach on hell at all, hardly, if not at all. Those aren't good preachers. Those are people you stay away from. Revelation 19, 20. We see, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with grindstone. The reason I started with this is this. You have the false prophet and the beast. Okay, The dragon, Satan, that serpent, is thrown into the bottom of his pit, and he's locked up for a thousand years, and he's let loose for a little while. Okay? Then he has to go before God to get judged. But notice right here, before the time of Jacob's, uh, I mean, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, before the day of the Lord starts, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, the false prophet and the beast are cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, flip over to Revelation 21. You might not have to move over, flip over. It's right there. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him and he should that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he be... He must be loosed for a little season. And you keep reading about how he's loosed. Fire comes down, destroys that, all the nations that turn against God. And the old heaven and the old earth are burnt up. And now we're going to go into the new heaven and new earth. But before the new heaven and new earth, there's judgment. The judgment seat of Christ. Revelation 20.10. You get down to Revelation chapter 10. I mean chapter 20 verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast... And the false prophet are, not were, like they're burnt up. They still are there, burning, are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what hell is. The Holy Spirit, the judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit tells us about hell. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. It tells us about where Satan's going. And it's supposed to be a fearful thing. Where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Where is the fear of God? The Holy Spirit comes in. True wisdom. God has made unto us wisdom. It starts with fearing God. It starts with loving God's Word and God's commandments. The Holy Spirit comes in. You start by feeling. You repent. You, you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. After God saves you, He gives you a love of His Word. And you still have that fear there. It's continuous. But you also now have a love of God's Word. And you do everything you can to keep it. And make sure that your life lines up with this book. And the true test about proving your own self and examining yourself where you be in the faith is based off this book. That's the true test. When someone's supposed to, someone can talk the talk, we keep saying this over and over, and I'm going to keep saying it over and over. Someone can talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. Both need to line up with the Word of God. And if they don't, something's not right. Either they're a false convert, are they becoming part? Are they are part of, or starting to become part of the falling away? Where you have brethren that are falling away. Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The fear of condemnation gets taken away. The fear of going to hell, it's gone. I'm not going to hell. 
I'm going to heaven. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ did for me. That fear is gone. Right? There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the capital S spirit. That's the evidence of somebody who fears God and loves God's word. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There are two laws. Are you under the law of the spirit of life? Or are you under the law that, oh, sorry, are you under the law of the spirit of life? If so, then you're then then you are in Christ Jesus. Are you under the law of sin and death? Then you're under the wages of sin is death. You're under the flesh. You're carnally minded walking after the flesh. Now, one thing I put down here is I'm not trying to confuse brethren or the lost world. I'm going to preach the one true way. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. But technically, there's two ways you can attempt. Technically, there's two ways you can attempt. There's only one way that's successful, but there's two ways you can attempt to go to heaven. You can try to, to keep the Levitical laws, the laws of God that are written on every man's heart. You can try to pass the law of, of I mean, the law of sin and death by trying to keep all the Levitical laws. Or you can go through Jesus Christ. Come to Him broken. Fearing God, broken, having sorrow in your heart for sinning against God, and fearing hell and the lake of fire. Fearing the God, who not the hell and lake of fire, but fearing the God that can send you there. He can send you there like that. You can die any second, and God <clears throat> sends you to hell. There's technically two ways you can attempt to go to heaven, but there's only one way that it is, that's successful, and that's through Jesus Christ. The law of sin and death, or the law of the spirit life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which one are you under? Remember, it talked about whose end is according to their works. If you're under the law of sin and death, trying to go through the Levitical laws, because you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to be judged by your works. But if you go through Jesus Christ, you're going to be judged by what Jesus Christ did for you. I paid the price for him. Now, it says, the law of spirit of life also refers to as the law of God. Sometimes you have the law of the spirit of life or the law of God. You can be under the law of God or the law of, the, of sin and death. Those are the two laws you can be under. But as we keep reading, we find out that the law of sin and death, no flesh can do it. No flesh can keep the law of sin and death. Only Jesus Christ did, and the only reason Jesus Christ did it is because he's God the Father manifest in the flesh. When Jesus speaks, God the Father is speaking. When Jesus was healing people, it was God the Father healing people. Be careful of those people that say God the Father is God, God the Son, which I agree with them, there is no God the Son. But be careful of those people that say the Son of God and God the Father are not one. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. They're calling Jesus a liar. Be careful of those people. I'd stay away from them at this point. They've been told, they've been a lot of the people that I follow, and I have some of their teachings, some of them refuse to give up the Trinity in the Trinity terms. And they keep saying God the Father is not the Son of God. They say God the Father is not God the Son. You're right, there's not two gods. There's only one true God, the Father. But they're trying to say, what they're really saying is that the Son of God and God the Father are not one. They are. Romans 8, 3, let's keep going. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. What the law could not do it was weak through the flesh. In other words, nobody could, could get through the law of sin and death. Nobody could be successful. Nobody could. So what did God do? God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. God gave up His incorruptible body in the Old Testament for a corruptible one, so he could take on the sins of the world. Talk about love. Talk about sacrifice. Verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the capitalist spirit. How is the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us? 
through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. That's how. That's how we go from being under the law of sin and death to being under the law of God. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the carnal, to be carnally minded is death. The law of sin and death. Oh, you can be carnally minded and walking after the flesh and be saved. No, if you're carnally minded, you are dead. You're under the law of sin and death. But to be spiritually minded is life, life, and peace. Here it is, because the carnal mind is enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Carnally, being carnally minded and walking after the flesh, it's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. What is the carnal mind in subjection to? The law of sin and death. If you're carnally minded, walking after the flesh, you're still under the law of sin and death. According to God's word. If you're spiritually minded, walking after the spirit, you're under the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. You're under, you have life and peace. Romans 8.8, 8, let's keep reading. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's across the board. When you start giving into the flesh and you start sinning as a saved sinner, you can't please God. But if you're carnally minded and walking after the flesh, you definitely can't please God. If you're still under the law of sin and death, we just got finished. Nobody can keep the law of sin and death. You don't, God's not pleased with you. God's wrath and God's judgment is upon you. You need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ. Verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. I still get frustrated with people who teach that Romans 8 is just talking about two types of Christians. That's a lie. That's a total lie. It's talking about a lost person versus a saved person. Now, if any man have, say, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Where's the evidence of the Holy Spirit? Where's the changed life? Where's the being spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit? We just read about how the Holy Spirit comes in and condemns the world of sin to put the fear of God in everyone. To put the fear in God in those of us who are saved that we stay in a standing position serving God and don't become in a fallen position. And to put the fear of God in Satan to remind him all the time of what's coming for him. And to put the fear in anybody who will follow him that what's going to happen to you, being a servant of Satan. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What's evidence that you have the Holy Spirit? You fear God, you love God. What's the evidence of fearing God and loving God? If you fear God, you're going to keep His commandments. And when you break His commandments, it's motivation to get you to repent, forsake, and get back to obeying His commandments. If you love God, you're going to, the evidence of loving God is you're going to keep God's words. You're going to keep God's words in the life that you're living. You're going to live a life of Christ. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Holy Spirit comes in, guides us in all truth, and teaches us how to fear God better, teaches us how to love God better with the life that we're living. It's evidence. God has made unto us wisdom. His wisdom. Do you have the Holy Spirit? What's your attitude towards God's perfect written word? What's your attitude towards God being the final authority? You're walking after the capital of spirit. I don't have this in my notes, I don't think, but the Holy Spirit says what he hears, that shall he speak. God is speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. God the Father is speaking to us through the Holy Spirit. We learn God's wisdom by the, through the Holy Spirit by His perfect written word, which is the King James Bible today. And we live it. We want to please God. We don't want to displease Him. We don't want the chase. If you truly fear God, you don't want the chastening of God on you. He is none of His. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Why does it say the body is dead because of sin? Well, because we're still under the law of sin. Paul talks about this. We're still under the law of sin. 
If you live after the flesh, you shall die. There's still consequences, physical consequences for sin in this life. There's still consequences for sin in eternity. Like I said, you can lose rewards in heaven because of your sin and wickedness as a saved sinner. If you start getting back into sin and wickedness, you can start losing rewards in heaven. You can lose uh, the inheritance if you don't suffer for Jesus Christ. You can lose that crown that talks about if you're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ every day. And when you have someone telling you that there's no imminent return of Jesus Christ, they're getting you to take your crown off. They're getting you to take out the helmet for a hope of salvation off. And you can lose rewards. But here's where liberty comes in. Romans 8.13 For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Where does liberty come in? As a saved sinner, I can sin. Not, I'm not saying I can sin like it, sin is okay. I can still fail the Lord in sin and still get to go to heaven. There's a cost still to sin. I can totally destroy this body down here. There's sin always, like I said, the ways of sin is death. I'm not, uh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. We just read that. My sins can affect my life down here and make life hard for me down here. It can hurt my health. It can hurt my relationships with people. It can hurt my relationship with God and my walk with God. And like I said, you can lose things like inheritance, uh, rewards, your health, your testimony. You can lose a lot of things because of, your, because of that sin. But the one thing you can never lose is, your, is the salvation that God has given you. You're sealed into the day of redemption. That's where true liberty comes in. And you've got people that attack true liberty in the King James Bible. No, liberty doesn't have anything to, Liberty has to do with, with us justifying sin and saying it's things we can agree to disagree on. No. We are, all, we are also under the law of God, but the spirit of life... We're, we're also under the law of God, where it says, But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 1 John 1, 1.9 If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're under the law of sin, but we're also under the law of God. The law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Which means, when we sin and fail the Lord, we repent and ask God to forgive us and He forgives us. Our sin... Our sinful nature now, because we're still de dealing with this wicked body of flesh as a saved sinner, is not going to send us to hell. When I was lost, it was. When I'm saved, it's not. That's where liberty comes in. Don't let anybody lie to you. Don't let anybody pervert what true liberty is. That's why Paul, I don't want to get into it too much, but Paul talks about don't use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Just because you have liberty and you won't lose your salvation doesn't mean you can sin all you want and now you can start justifying sin and saying things that God says is a sin is now okay. That's the perversion of liberty today. They're trying to add idolatry, wickedness, and sin and trying to justify it through liberty. And Paul says you're not to use liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Notice what we just read there. But those who do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. What's this false liberty doing? It's praising the flesh. It's not mortifying the deeds of the flesh. When, you, when I sin against God as a saved sinner, I'm mortified by my deeds. I'm horrified by what I did. And I repent and forsake. There's new liberty that they're pushing. You can have pleasure in, in unrighteousness. Being lovers of pleasure is more than lovers of God. Anyway... If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once again, this is where liberty comes in. When you fail the Lord, God will forgive you. He won't take salvation from you. He won't say, oh, you sinned, therefore you lost salvation, I'm going to send you to hell. No, this is where liberty comes in. God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Once again, liberty. You grieve the Holy Spirit when you feel like you've, you've lost your salvation because of your wicked sin. And that you can lose your salvation. That's when you grieve the Holy Spirit. 
Brothers of Christ, that's where we come in and say, hey, if that motivates you to get back on the right path with the Lord, amen. But we're here to tell you that's what liberty comes in. You didn't lose your salvation. You just failed the Lord miserably. Yeah, you failed the Lord. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah, you failed the Lord miserably. But you didn't lose your salvation. We're under the law of, of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. And the evidence of that is we have the Holy Spirit. And the evidence that we have the Holy Spirit is what we, we fear God, which is keeping His commands. And we love God, which is keeping His words. And the Holy Spirit comes in and motivates that and nurtures that desire. And He opens up the Scriptures to us so we know what God's commands are. We know what God's words are. Okay. Romans 6.23, another thing. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. With liberty, we're not earning wages. We're earning rewards today. When you get saved and born again, you're still going to have to answer to Jesus Christ for the life you're living as a saved sinner. But we're not earning wages. That's where liberty comes in. The lost world earns wages. wages. Why? Because they don't have that seal. They're not sealed into the day of redemption. They don't have that seal. They're under the laws of sin and death. We aren't. Once God pulls you away from the law of sin and death and puts you under the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, no amount of sin that you do is going to cause you to lose that salvation. Because you can't lose it. It's not yours. That's the whole point. But brothers and Christ, you have these easy believism, and they just sin all they want. There was no fear of God. They don't love God. The evidence, not words, because in words they'll say, I fear God, I love God. But the evidence, their works, their deeds say that they don't fear God and they don't love God's word. Those who are saved are not earning wages, but earning rewards and losing rewards. Earning or losing the inheritance, the day of the Lord. We talked about that. Last thing real quick to wrap this up is I want to end it with the mind of Christ. Just real quick, read some few verses real quick. The mind of Christ. Made unto us wisdom. Are we supposed to have, are we supposed to be carnally minded, walking after the flesh? Are we supposed to be spiritually minded, walking after the spirit? We're supposed to be spiritually minded. Remember where the Holy Spirit gets his words? From God the Father. Okay, when we have the mind of Christ, Jesus Christ, he is God the Father. Remember when he spoke, God the Father was speaking through him. God the Father speaks through His Son. God the Father speaks through His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But it's God the Father we're getting it from. But we're supposed to have the mind of Christ today. How many people out there that I talk to, that I'm trying to witness to, that profess, has a profession of faith, they don't have the mind of Christ? James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Okay, I'm going through these. We ask God for wisdom, and He gives it to us. By the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.16 For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Remember, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But you have to have the Holy Spirit. Who, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. 1 John 3.2 Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right now, brothers and Christ, we're only two-thirds redeemed. The Holy Spirit, I mean our spirit and our soul are redeemed, but this flesh, a fleshly sinful body isn't redeemed. Right now we have the mind of Christ as far as he's given us his word, but there's going to come a day, brothers and Christ, there's going to be no more division. Praise God. We're all going to be one. Like we're supposed to be right now, we're all supposed to be one. But there's going to come a day where God's going to make it happen. No more division. We're all going to have the mind of Christ as far as he's going to answer all our questions. So I threw that in there too. But one day, one day, we're going to be... There's just some things that people will ask me, well, what about this, what about this? I don't know. God knows. Maybe God will show it to me someday, but He hasn't shown me that. But what's talking about we have the mind of Christ, it's talking about the Holy Spirit that's in us. Now how it says, Jesus Christ said, I will be with you. And then He says, God the Father is going to send the, the Comforter to be with you. 
If you have the Comforter, you have Jesus Christ. If you have the Comforter, you have God the Father. They're all one. The Holy Spirit that's in you. Okay. Philippians 2.1, it says, if there, if, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What's that like-minded of that one mind that we're supposed to be? Now, I'm not putting these guys down, but like Peter Ruckman, are we supposed to be of like-minded with Peter Ruckman and of one mind with Peter Ruckman? Brian Denlinger, ex catholics for Christ, Sam Gipp, David Daniels, Philip Newton, uh, Brad Abenshine, um, Alexander Hartley, these are brethren that are trying to do work for the Lord online. So I'm throwing all this stuff because these are men online that I've listened to them and learned things from. Is that the mind that it's talking about? And I threw my name in there. Some people didn't might not have noticed, but I threw Philip Newton. Are you supposed to be like-minded of one mind when it comes to me? No. What's the one mind that we're supposed to be a, a part of? The mind of Christ. And we are all supposed to be like-minded with the mind of Christ as the foundation. Right here, the Word of God. What happens when you come across people that aren't that? If you're dealing with someone who's a false convert, a wolf in sheep's clothing that comes in and scatters the flock. Okay, today the body of Christ is being taught the satanic doctrine that we can agree to disagree. You have these wolves in sheep's clothing that have whizzled their way into the body of Christ. They're not part of us, but they pretend and they start sowing this false satanic doctrine that we can agree to disagree on the scriptures. And you know how we know that's wrong? Even if you try to fight about it, you know how I know whether you want to believe it or not, how I know that's wrong? A, the scriptures say we're to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Not once does Paul ever say we can agree to disagree. Not once. You ask them chapter and verse, they can't find it. It's not there. But the other reason is you look at the fruit. If it was okay for us to agree to disagree, the fruit would be the body of Christ is united and we stand together. But what's the fruit of this false satanic teaching that we can agree to disagree? Division. Look how divided the body of Christ is today. Why? Because of the false teaching of we can agree to disagree. We can agree to disagree on Godhead versus the Trinity. We can agree to disagree on pre-time pre of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ versus post and mid-trib. Uh, we can agree to disagree on the gospel. We can agree to disagree on the Bible versions. We can agree to disagree on satanic holidays. We can agree to disagree on whether sin is sin or if sin is okay. Like Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, uh, satanic style music. I got into it with a group, and I, I, I hope some of them were actually saved, but they all weren't acting like it. But got into it with a group of so-called brethren with their wicked sin. But they've been taught this false liberty that we can agree to disagree. What does that do, brothers and Christ? What's the fruit of that? It sows division. It divides. That's exactly what Satan wants. Why are you serving Satan if you're pushing this false teaching? Why are you, why are you at this point, why are you purposely trying to divide the body of Christ? We're supposed to be the same mind and the same judgment. Acts 15.5 we read, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the laws of Moses, whereas they agreed to dis the laws of Moses. Now, if you read that whole story, they came together among the elders and the apostles and everything, the, the ordained elders, the apostles, the uh, deacons, the bishops, all the, the men in ministry, the elders, the ordained, they came together to discuss the matter. But my question is, is where was the agree to disagree there? Where was it? Where was the degree to disagree? Some have to keep the laws of Moses and be circumcised, and some don't have to. We can agree to disagree. That's the best example I can give where this is Christ in the Bible. They had a disagreement. And you can read how they solved the disagreement. It came to the point where it's not about keeping the law and being circumcised. It's about repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And one of the biggest things they told the, the Gentiles is that they need to stay away from idols and food offered unto idols. False gods. You're to stay true to the one true God. That's why it irritates me, these men that have fallen away, that defend Christmas. It's pagan. It's been proven. But we don't need to go into that all again. But the thing is, is where's the agree to disagree? It's not there. Philippians 2, 3 we read, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 we read, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Strife or vainglory. But in lowness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Today, we see a lot of brethren, especially men in ministry, that esteem themselves. But they're not esteeming others better than themselves. It's all about, come on, praise me, praise me, esteem me. Yeah. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a, as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. I still stand firm for Jesus Christ. It's not Yahweh, it's not Yeshua, it's not Yahashua, it's not Emmanuel, pardon me, it's not Emmanuel. Now some of these might be titles for God. Okay, Yahashua just means Joshua. Okay, but Yahweh it might be a title for God, but it's not the name whereby we are saved. It's not the name which is above every name. Here it is, that the name of Jesus, not Yahweh, not Yahashua, not Yeshua, not Emmanuel, and all the Old Testament, not Jehovah, not the Old Testament titles, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. See, in heaven, we're still going to get judged. When we get to go to heaven someday, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be judged. The people in the world are going to be judged. And things under the earth, death and hell are going to be pulled up, and they're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no we can agree to disagree. That is satanic doctrine. Through and through. Complete and total satanic doctrine. You have wolves in sheep's clothing coming in to bring in false doctrine. And you have saved slash lost, use it to justify sin and wickedness. That's the, that's the fruit. It causes division, and it causes those who are saved to fall. They're using this, we can agree to disagree, to justify sin and wickedness, to, to, to justify idolatry. And the false, it's also, it's, this teaching is allowing false converts to come in and thrive among the body of Christ. That we can agree to disagree. We can agree to disagree. Uh, no, we cannot. I have the Holy Spirit in me. Here's the Word of God. I fear God and I love God. I love Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep His Word to prove that I love Jesus Christ. I fear God and I'm going to prove by doing my best to keep His commands and not fail Him. And I have. And when I do fail Him, that fear is going to be a motivator to get my butt back on the right path by repenting. And asking God to pick me back up. And he will. Repenting and saying, Lord, I am sorry for straying. Brothers and sisters of Christ, today, more than anything, today, we need to keep our eyes on the eternal. Our eyes and heart on the eternal. When it comes to wisdom, we're supposed to be living a light of Christ. Uh, like I said, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Loving God is keeping God's Word, and the Holy Spirit comes in and shows us God's Word. What are people's attitude towards God's Word? You want to test somebody? What's their attitude towards absolute truth? And when, when you see their attitude towards absolute truth and the Word of God, you'll start seeing that they don't fear God, that they don't really love God. They're their own lowercase g God. They're their own final authority. God's not their final authority. And brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the tricks of the world is they try to distract you from this. 
Oh, no, 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 let's distract you with drama that's going on in the body of Christ. Let's distract you with the drama that's going on out in the world, okay? Satan and the world and your flesh try to entice you with the here and now. And I want to warn you, brothers and Christ, 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Remember we talked about rewards in heaven. You can lose those things down here by not living right. But our eyes and our motivation for living right, one of the motivations, you've got the fear, you've got the love of God, but you've still got those rewards. How we're going to live in eternity. How many of you stop to think about how am I going to live in eternity with my Lord and Savior, with my brothers and sisters in Christ? I better get busy living for the Lord and earn some rewards up there. I believe when you actually look into the rewards, the rewards are based off of how you're going to be able to serve God for all eternity and live with God and our brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. A good example of that is the inheritance. If you do not suffer for Jesus Christ, you're going to get stuck in heaven while the rest of the brethren who did suffer for Jesus Christ get to come down and rule and reign with them for a thousand years. You'll be stuck in heaven and you won't get to come down with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I, I can't say for certain I know exactly what the rewards will be like. We'll find out when we get there. But I, I understand by my reading of the, of the Word of God that it has something to do with how we're going to be able to serve God for the rest of our life. And your eyes need to be on Jesus Christ. Your eyes need to be on up there, eternity. 1 Corinthians 2.9 we read, But it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We need to focus on this in our life down here and living for Jesus Christ. And one of the good ways to do it is you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. You keep your eyes on eternity. That sin that the flesh is trying to talk you into is not worth it. This is just temporal. It's not worth losing something up there. Turning your back on major, do oh, I say major, but doctrine, period, any doctrine in the Bible, it's not worth it because I'm going to have to answer for it for an eternity up there. Sin's not worth it. Worth it. Turning your back on, on the book isn't worth it. Mistreating the brethren isn't worth it. And I could go on and on and on, but, uh, okay. Is your eyes out there? I put down here another good test on the fallen state of a brother or sister in Christ or someone that is a false convert. What are their priorities? Does God come first? God, through His written word, the life you live, the evidence that God and His written word come first is the life that you're living. How you're treating your body, which is a temple for the Holy Ghost, how you're treating the brethren, and how you treat the lost world. That's evidence that God comes first and His Word comes first. Okay. What are your priorities? Does the world come first? Does the flesh come first? There's some brethren that have gotten into a fallen state because this world is more important. People keep kicking me, but it's like people, the Hollywood movies and TV shows and video games and, and satanic style music is more important. Drunkenness is more important. Getting high is more important. Living your dream life is more important. Sometimes, and I've made this mistake, getting married is more important. Having kids is like that dream of a family can get in the way. God can still bless you with that. Absolutely. But some of us jump the gun and try to do it ourselves. Because things down here get to be more important than things up there. What's your priorities? Does God come first? Like I said, when I know someone in some brother's life where God is not coming first, the next thing i got to look at go, why? Why isn't God coming first? Brothers and Christ, in my life, when I find myself falling flat on my face, what happened? God wasn't coming first. I got too distracted about down here, thinking I'm missing out on something down here. There's something down here that I really want and I really need. I want to have it. And God wasn't coming first. The real wisdom is, this is not it. If you want to help with your wisdom, the beginning wisdom is fear, but ultimately the fear is this is temporary. This is not it. There's nothing down here that's worth me not getting saved. And we've gotten saved, brothers and Christ. 
There's nothing down here that's worth me losing rewards in heaven for eternity. There's nothing down there that's going to cause me to lose the inheritance and not be able to come back and rule and reign with Jesus Christ and my brothers and sisters in Christ. There's nothing down here that's worth affecting your eternity with Jesus Christ. There's nothing down here. This is not my home. It's just a place I dwell in until I get to be called, until I get that call to come home. You know why the Bible says we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters Christ? Because this isn't our home. That's what an ambassador is. An ambassador is someone who's in a foreign land being a representative. We're supposed to represent Jesus Christ. We're in a foreign land. Preaching the gospel, being a living witness by the life that we're living, fearing God, loving God, knowing God, and it reflects by the life that we're living. And we're able to show other people by the life that we're living and our words. We're ambassadors. This isn't our home. But you got some people that are pushing their dream life, their best life now. i got to have my best life now. This is not our best life. This is supposed to be our worst life. I'm not saying you have to just be miserable. There's times God, I have days where I'm, I'm sorrowful. I have days where I'm happy. There's times where God gives me a laugh every now and then. And I, I, I laugh and say, thank you, Lord, for that laugh. I, I really needed it. God can give us peace and joy and happiness even in these dark times. But we're going to have sorrow. We're going to have a tribulation. We're going to have pain and anguish. Losing a family member. I lost my daughter to the world, and then I lost my daughter in death. She never got saved. Pain and anguish. I've, I've had family members turn against me. I've had brethren turn against me that said, I love you one minute, the next minute I hate you. Because I stand for the truth, and they want the world. And they want to put on a show that they, they want to put on a show like they still stand for the truth and have the world. Brothers says Christ, down here is not it. This isn't it. I gotta keep reminding myself, this isn't it. My home's up there. There is a God out there with a perfect written word that has been written down and preserved, and only by the Holy Spirit are we able to learn it and hide it in our hearts. If you through this, through this long in depth study, I apologize. I just want to talk with the brethren and share the word of God with you to encourage you. This is not it. Continue to fear the Lord, and the evidence of that is keeping God's commands. It goes hand in hand, and loving God, which is keeping His word, and knowing God, which you have to do. Second Timothy two fifteen, the Holy Spirit comes in and takes the word of God, puts it in your heart, and applies it to your life. There's evidence that you know God by works. Continue to examine whether you be in the faith every day. And the moment you think, you think you're think you compromising a little bit, nip it in the bud. It's like a hair. When you have hair, where you have that one hair that seems to grow faster than others. When you have one hair that's longer than the other, you just nip it quick. So it don't, you don't look weird, right? Same thing with compromise. When you find out that you're starting to compromise a little bit here or a little bit there, you need to nip it quick. Don't compromise. Don't faint. Don't falter. Stand, stand, stand. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'm praying for you. Please pray for me. I'll see you in the next video.